users or less optimal technical rules. So strength number three, irons in the fire. In response to the broadband team, Ruth and Julie and their teams get a clear A for effort. And I know I said I wasn't going to grade, but they're just doing such a great job. Um, it seems to me that every time we start a new preceding, it's spectrum related. Uh, we've had three new items just this week, only three, all three were wireless, um, and 60% of all open meeting items in the past five months have been spectrum related. OET alone has started more proceedings this year than in the past two years combined. The challenge is that we have started so much, but we have finished relatively little. This is, of course, an unfair criticism because an inherent problem of taking a snapshot of an agency at an artificial date, it, it's unfair. But regardless of that, I think we need to bring these matters to a final decision, an objective I know that I share with the staff, where we can say 2010 was a year of asking questions, 2011 has to be a year of action. So in doing so, I think we should prioritize those efforts that can help with the 4G build out next year. I spoke last month about, this was actually hard, we came up with the idea first. What are the four things that we can help to start, jump start 4G? When you get an idea like that and you say, oh yeah, a catchy title, four things for 4G, it's kind of hard to come up with. But these are concrete things that we can really do. Um, you focus on MSS, secondary markets, service rules, and get a rural action plan. I think our energy should really be focused on what steps we can take to affirmatively promote faster both the build out of 4G and the actual broadband speed. Do this more rapidly nationwide. Um, I would like to see a focus on infrastructure in particular. There are wireless backhaul opportunities that need action, as well as the potential for wireless backhaul in the TV bands. Infrastructure is but one of the challenges that the unserved and the underserved wireless communities face. We need to take a more focused look at a handful of those communities, whether they are in, for instance, West Texas or mountainous West Virginia, imagine how I'm getting this list, um, rural Maine. To work, we want to focus on these guys work with the industry and the communities on what are the actual incentives that are necessary and the resources that are needed to push wireless services, particularly 4G to all Americans. If we can get a more detailed analysis of the challenges faced in the rural America, I think it will better inform our spectrum policies and I think it will highlight the opportunities for investment and entrepreneurs. It will also give us a blueprint to drive wireless coverage deeper across the country. My guess is that there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all approach, but there will be some commonalities in the challenges that we face, and we can address them head on. The more fundamental challenge comes from the Commission's non-spectrum decisions that can have effects on undermining all of these promising spectrum-specific steps. Earlier this year, the Commission refused to find the mobile market to be competitive in its annual report. This was despite 91% of Americans having a choice of at least four wireless voice providers. The mobile broadband statistics were even more fantastic. From 2008 to 2009 alone, the number of consumers with a choice of three mobile broadband providers had jumped from 51% to 76%. Couple that with the unfortunate decision with the troubling Harbinger satellite merger condition that singled out two uninvolved wireless carriers for special restrictions on future spectrum access, potentially inhibiting the organic evolution of a wholesale 3G or 4G spectrum market. The practical concerns is that findings like these suggest a more interventionist government approach, a competition policy that micromanages what has been a wildly successful and customer-driven market. This has genuine investment chilling consequences. In this regard, how will we address the question of data roaming in the months to come? This is going to be important to watch. As an agency, we still have yet to come to grips with our lack of statutory authority to act. Wow, I know that sounds familiar to some of the other issues we're working on now, doesn't it? But now, from a policy perspective, I can certainly understand the goal of data roaming, ubiquitous, interconnected data networks. But expanding voice rules to data is far from a straightforward exercise, and it is actually almost a mission impossible legally. It also fails to capture all of our key policy goals. Our focus must be on providing the incentives we need for 4G network investments. I would hope also that we would better understand the market before we interceded. 
We need to know more information about how this new market is working in practice. Is it a 2G, a 3G, or a 4G issue? What is the status of negotiations? We spent time and really encouraged the industry to work together to find solutions. Are they? Thus far, I have not seen clear evidence of industry-wide challenges, but I think we need more information before we act. Okay, so I'm going to briefly just touch on the um, thing you probably wanted me to talk about for the entire time I was up here, <laughs> and that's the 800-pound gorilla in our space, which is net neutrality. Um, my position is absolutely clear. Uh, the courts have told us that we have no authority to act, and Congress has told us plainly not to act. Moving forward is a legal and political mistake. It is also the wrong policy decision. There is no identified market failure or systematic public interest harm that we are seeking to curb. The Internet is open today. I'm going to repeat it. The Internet is open today. We see billions of investment across all sectors of the Internet economy, and consumers are benefiting from new services, faster connections, and the latest and greatest applications. There is no problem to be solved. What we are doing is checking the box on a campaign promise, and we are doing it in a non-transparent and non-data-driven manner. See, I'm kind of clear about this. <laughs> um, one of my biggest, really, one of my biggest frustrations is that this partisan political decision may inhibit our ability to achieve what, what is much broader consensus here, agenda. Central to that agenda is the spectrum reform that I've just talked about. We have clear momentum in this space and bipartisan agreement that we need to revamp our approach to spectrum comprehensively. To move forward, we need Congress to provide us the tools to do so, including but not limited to incentive auction authority. We actually need to be partnering with the new Congress and we need to work together to find sensible middle ground positions. We have a window of opportunity and I have real concerns that moving forward aggressively with a controversial network neutrality proposal will only hamper our ability to achieve our shared goals. Um, but I don't want to leave on a sour note. So on spectrum related issues, I think there's much to be thankful for in 2010. Um, I'm still kind of remembering Thanksgiving because I'm driving a rental car because our kids wrecked ours. But, um, <laughs> We have started thinking more holistically about spectrum and we have coalesced around the need for significantly more spectrum and we have started countless promising proceedings to promote more efficient spectrum use. The most exciting thing about the spectrum policy is how many additional strengths I haven't talked about today. The SEC's new spectrum dashboard, the clearest manif manifestation of our inventory of commercial spectrum, was rolled out this year. Important advancements for the dashboard are in the works to add additional inf information to facilitate secondary market transactions. The potential of white spaces is about to be realized and important progress is being made on dynamic spectrum access. So now the hard part. We need to identify specific spectrum for future auctions with concrete reallocation plans and timetables. We need to identify the right spectrum, not just 500 megahertz to check a box. We need to complete dockets that are central to 4G deployment. We need to do all of this in a way that avoids investment chilling steps that run the risk of stopping short the rapid deployment and adoption of terribly exciting generations of mobile broadband services. We have our work cut out for us and we will need all of your help. We appreciate what you do and um, couldn't do what I do without you. So, Thanks for having me here. Thanks, amazing, for this beautiful award. It's going to be prominently, prominently displayed. Um, so, thanks for having me. And if you want me to take some questions, I'm happy to do so. Yes. Okay. looking at it and I think we're trying a couple different things you know some of our dynamic spectrum access that we just did this past week I think is going to encourage spot license lit licensing which is of course in secondary markets um, I think the spectrum dashboard the first one we rolled out 
had a lot of mistakes in it. I think it's not an easily accessible information. So I think um, I think I have high hopes. What I've said for secondary markets is I think we need a very clear database, and I think it needs to be accessible. Um, we're going to work on that for white spaces, and I hope that 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 database kind of then encompasses both all commercial spectrum and federal spectrum. You know, again, I think we should look at this holistically. The dashboard's great. Is that the database? Not exactly. Is white space is the database? Not exactly. Um, so I'm glad we're moving forward. I think that's progress. I, you know, to my, not to sound like a broken record, but to my, um, my thoughts, it needs to be a spectrum plan that includes a, a spectrum database that includes all of this, or at least has the prospect for all of these things to come together and build together. What we need is a comprehensive spectrum database that I think, if it's public and it's accessible, then I think you're going to find particularly secondary markets in rural places. Um, Ed Evans is making a great go of it in Texas and other spots. So um, time, I think time. No, uh, let me uh, just say my thank you, Commissioner Baker. Once again, thank you so much, Commissioner. It was sure. wonderful. Um, and in just real conclusion, I want to thank everybody for showing up, not just for this symposium, but for the last 10. I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers. It was truly fantastic that they were willing to come and have this conversation. Um, usually I thank my wife at this point because she's usually the person who works the front desk, but she unfortunately has a flu, so I owe a really particular thank you to my mom, and if, who was working the front desk. We're a small operation, and of course the, the biggest joke is is that I've got you know some of the biggest players in telecom in one room, and she looks at me and goes, I still haven't figured out what you do for a living. <laughs> um, I said, well, when you do, let me know, because I'm still working on it. But I want to thank, again, everybody for coming out. Uh, we look forward to the next 10 years and beyond. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody next year. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good one.